Welcome to CulturCast. My name is Sister Mary Michael, and I'm a Dominican Sister of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. You may have seen us, as we are located all around the world. Following in the footsteps of St. Dominic, our mission is to be teachers and preachers. And this calling puts us in front of all kinds of interesting people, in interesting places, doing interesting things. All for a great purpose, much larger than any one of us, like being on Oprah, the Dominican Sisters of Mary invited us to their big day. Look at this. On the top of the Billboard classical music charts, or on a television game show. You better believe it! Join me every week as the Culture Cast takes you inside Heaven's Kitchen to show you how to cook for an army and become a culinary artist. Or go on the road with the sisters and become traveling pilgrims as you learn all the things that can be seen and those that are unseen. Or sit down with Mother Assumpta Long as she unlocks a few stories from some unsuspecting guests. Join us for unlikely adventures, and together, let's learn new things, see new places, and meet new faces on The Culture Cast. This week on The Culture Cast, join us for conversations with Mother Assumpta Long. We are so tremendously privileged to have Dr. Mary Hassan with us. And, you know, Mary, I honestly looked at her portfolio and I have no clue where to begin. I mean, you have so many accomplishments, but, but I I would, I really think I could be wrong, but you can tell me. I think your greatest accomplishments would be your family of origin and also your own beautiful family, seven children. Absolutely. Oh, that's, so, that's well, the best listen, thing I've done in life. We have to find it, because some of us know certainly your father. Mm-hmm. I wasn't privileged to know your mother, but I did know your father. So could you just tell us a little bit about him or oh, how sure. he influenced you sure. and your siblings? Yeah, and they were both wonderful parents. You know, oh, both, I'm sure. Both that have away. to be. But um, my dad had a vision of family life, and he had a vision for our, our formation. And so even from when we were little... Um, he started out by teaching us to read when we were younger, but he would, he and my mom too, but, but mostly my dad. My dad was kind of the teacher. Yeah. He would be teaching us catechism. He would be um, teaching us history. He would be engaging us in conversations about church teachings. And so his, his vision for us was that we would grow up not just to be practicing Catholics, but to be well formed and that we would be in the fray, that we would be out there trying to, to share the truth and to bring others to him. And mom was a tremendous partner with him in that. She was formidable in her own right, you know, and she would (laughs) speak to people. And she had a knack of drawing out of people their personal stories and finding ways to, you know, hear hear what their their sorrow or their difficulty was and and to kind of point them in the right direction. She just had a, a gift for that. Well, you know, they must be rejoicing in heaven right now because you certainly, the children, I, I'm just amazed yeah. at, at all the accomplishments they've made. And what is so exciting to me is you do it as as just this wonderful Catholic witness. Mm-hmm. But let's look, what about your own family, your yeah. own children? You have seven. Yeah, and I met my husband, uh, Kevin Seamus is his nickname, okay. um, Hassan at Notre Dame Law School. We were both students oh. there. And even from that time, he had, he had a strong faith, but he had a strong interest in religious liberty. So oh. after we got married um, and we moved to Washington, he practiced for a little while, and then he started the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Oh, and, and so around our dinner table, raising our kids, it was in many respects similar to what I grew up with, in that we were talking about issues of faith and talking about the culture and talking about the church and and it's the need exciting. to not just live it, Amazing. but to bring it to others. So, so I have seven kids. Um, there's five boys and, and two girls, although uh, they're not boys and girls anymore. They're, <laughs> they're young adults. Yeah. Our youngest just graduated from high school. Oh, my goodness. So, and I, I was uh, privileged, really, to be able to be at home with them 
for many years. That's wonderful. So, That's what I was going to ask you. I think, how did you balance all uh, that you are doing and raising mm -hmm. seven children? I can't even imagine. You know what, I, so, I think my mom was a really good witness there, and my yeah, dad too, because yeah. he really... He was proud of my mom being a mom, and 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 yet she was smart. She went to law school herself, and um, but I knew from the time I got married, well, and even before then, that I wanted to be a mom, and God gifted us with children, and so I wanted to be present. I wanted to raise our kids, and because of my legal background, um, I stopped practicing law after a few years. But I was able to do writing, and so I did a lot of um, writing and, and work really a lot for the church while I was home with the kids, but I had control over it in the way that... That's wonderful. You know, I didn't have to work over Christmas or their vacations and, and things like that. But um, it was, I think it was just built into us that whatever you're doing, whether you're at home or you were, of course you're going to do something to, to serve the kingdom. Now, do I have this right? Uh, I found it interesting where you said you met your husband in, in law school. Did your parents meet in Notre Dame Law School also? They were at um, Boston College. Oh, Boston College. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they also oh, met I in law see. school. Okay. But they, yeah. but they met in, in law yeah. school. Yeah. And, Although oh, my mom, yeah. my mom didn't finish. My dad always used to joke that he saved her from, <laughs> from the rest of, <laughs> of good. law. That's so, good. Yeah. Now, am I correct in saying you did some work with the UN? What was that? Well, what yeah, was that? so what I do now is, um, well, a couple of things. So yeah. I, although I started out in law, I didn't practice law, I kept my license, but um, I ended up doing writing and, and doing a lot of work for the church and took some theology courses and started working for diocese on uh, oh, marriage prep okay. and, and things like that. Um, but then my husband got Parkinson's disease uh, oh, when he was 41. He was oh. 62. And so we knew that it would be in our future that I would be going back to work full time see, to support I the family. See. So in thinking about that, um, I looked at, at going back to active law practice. But really, by then, I'd built up a lot of expertise on the church's moral teachings and, and the culture and had written a lot That's about those wrong. things. So I went to a think tank, which is where I am, the Ethics and Public oh, Policy Center. That, that Kate O'Byrne, um, yeah. what, what are you... What do you do there? I mean, what, yeah. How is that involved? Really? So I'm, I'm the Cato Byrne Fellow at yeah. the Ethics and Public Policy Center. And the Ethics and Public Policy Center is kind of a, a unique think tank in that it has Jewish scholars, um, Christian scholars, and Catholic yeah. scholars. And together we try to bring Judeo-Christian values to bear on public policy. But yes. I work pretty much just on Catholic things, both inside for the church, but trying to bring a Catholic perspective out um, into public policy debates or, or um, just expertise in some way. So I was uh, fortunate to be asked by um, the um, representative to the UN, Archbishop Auza, um, okay. and his staff to speak during the UN Commission on the Status of Women. So for the past three years, have been part of events that they've done and spoken on things from women in work to uh, education for women and girls, and then most recently on gender ideology. So that's, yeah. that's been a tremendous opportunity to really bring oh forward goodness. Catholic thinking, not mm -hmm. necessarily labeled as Catholic, but to try to reach a broader international audience. Well, that is, that is going to be an issue, certainly, of the future. Yeah. It is an issue now, but yeah. even more so in the future. Mm -hmm. Since we're in education, um, do you have any, any words of wisdom of, of, uh, of what, what we can do to kind of... Mm -hmm stem the tide or yeah well here's what i think i think catholic education is more critical than ever right. because we right. used to have a christian culture mm -hmm. and so even families that were struggling uh the culture would kind of pull you along in the right direction but mm -hmm. but what families face now is is like a riptide the culture is like a riptide yeah. pulling our kids in the wrong direction and so the school is critically important to help parents shape their children in not just the Catholic faith, but even just reasoning and the ability to value truth and to see truth and uh, just all that that entails. So I see Catholic education as one of the most important things in the church right now. And, and it's sad to see that the numbers have shrunk in terms of families who are, um, who right. have their kids That's in Catholic right. school. But here's a, I'll yeah. share with you a statistic oh, good. Good. that, um, is it ought to shake parents up a little bit. 
and CARA, the Center for Applied Research yes, in the yes. Apostolate, they do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. And they had a, a study comparing millennials okay. um, and their practice of the faith, depending on whether they went to public schools or whether they went to Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at millennial adults and the ones who went all the way through public schools, by the time they're adults, only 5% of them are going to weekly mass. Just 5%. So I wonder mm -hmm. how many parents actually think about that. You know, that if I send my yes, child all the way yes, through public school, yes. the odds are not good that they're going to hold on to their faith because the cultural onslaught is so, yeah, so strong. Sure. And with Catholic schools, the number's better. It's not ideal, but it's, it's close to 40% of kids who go all the way through Catholic mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. who will continue to practice their faith by attending oh, Mass God. every week. And so you can see right there oh, the yes, difference yes. that a Catholic school yeah. makes. But I think what you do in education, what your sisters do with not just the witness, but getting to know the families and, and being able to have those conversations to, right. to help them and to... Um, you know, to just arm them with that's the word right. of God. And that, that's all we want to do is to, you know, do anything we can, for, to, you mm -hmm. know, to mm -hmm. aid the parents yeah. because parents are the primary educators mm -hmm. of their children. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, if you have any thoughts on this, but does it have anything to do with the internet or what, whatever, the social mm -hmm. media, but what, what confuses me today is, is is the, the people don't think they're mm. not they're not thinking they're uh, what happens to the brain yeah. that there's no logical logical conclusion of mm. of, of their thought process yeah. what's happening you just think well, where do, where do, and even some some people that you would put your faith in you think how did you get off I mean mm. how did you mm -hmm. get I think there know? there are two things going on there yeah. one the the current culture that technology the social media mm -hmm. is not conducive to deep thinking you know, okay. you, that's, you, that's you notice that's even, a, yeah. even the articles are yeah. shorter yeah. because we don't have the attention span and yes. everything is so yes. fast and fast moving and yes. kids click through one website after another so yeah. so we're conditioning ourselves not to think and dwell and and reflect but to just keep moving and to grasp like grazing you know grasp little tidbits yeah. but that's exacerbated something that went on before. And I think from the 60s, 70s, 80s, we saw the idea of moral relativism taking hold. And people have okay. lost the okay. idea that there yeah. is a truth. And so... That's, yeah, that's... Well, if you lose that, where do you go? Yeah, you know, where right. Do you, where do you find it? Right. You're going to find it in other places, too. Right, and you're not going to be likely to bump into it accidentally <laughs> just in surfing that's the true. internet, that's you know, true. or social media conversation. So the two things, I think, yeah. together... Have created a real problem, yeah. and the breakdown of the family life, like you say, yeah. like my own family and mm. yours. You know, you're just raised in an environment yeah. where, where the Catholic Church, you know, and the teachings of the of the truths of our faith, right. just gave you a strength. So, mm -hmm. you know, you knew what you were doing. Right, right. Um, now, let me ask you this because I'm amazed at uh, because I've been to several places, the Napa Conference and the mm. uh, uh, where they. What, what they do, the Blessed Chapel of the Business yeah. School. And I, I see you and I think, you have so many opportunities and thank God you do mm -hmm. to go and speak. How do you keep up with all this? Or how, uh, what, do you, what do you find that most people are eager to hear? That well, you, that why they would, yeah. you know, want you to come? So I hear about two things. I, one, the transgender issue oh, yeah. is... Yeah. Very much in front of people because mm -hmm. it used to be when I'd give talks about that, you know, a year or two ago, yes. someone would come up afterwards and say, well, a friend of a friend is having trouble with their daughter or son. And yeah. now every time I give a talk, someone is coming up and they're saying, it's my son or it's I'm my sure. daughter. I'm so sure. this, this mm -hmm. problem has become personal for us. So I do a lot of speaking about that to try to help schools train their teachers to speak to priests and Wonderful. dioceses and, and parents and just helping people see the beauty of Catholic anthropology, of the vision yeah. of the person. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one thing. And then the other question I get is um, from parents who are more in my generation. Mm -hmm. And for many of them, their kids have fallen away from the faith. And they're looking at their grandkids and they're saying, what can I do? And right. I think there's a power in grandparents that even if your own kids have, have fallen away or are taking a meandering path, you know, hopefully yeah. God will bring them back. But you have a relationship with your grandkids 
that I think is a powerful opportunity to not just be a witness of the faith, but to engage them because, you know, sometimes there's a little bit more openness. Yes. You know, it's interesting you say that because we have found that we've, we've talked about that, the, how the influence of grandparents on the grandchildren. It's, it's beautiful yeah. to think. You know, I always have to remember God's in charge and yeah. He loves us more than we love ourselves. Right. And I think, oh my goodness, is everybody going crazy? And yet I know that God and, and we have wonderful people like you and well, George Weigel mm-hmm. and so many wonderful people going around just teaching the truth, mm-hmm. just consistently teaching the truth. And since we're in education, We've got, to, you know, like you said, your father made sure that you were well formed, mm, mm-hmm. and that's what we want to do with our sisters. You know, mm-hmm. they've got to be well formed yeah. in the faith. We can't presume when they enter the community first that they have been that formed in the faith or mm-hmm. in um, and what I think it needs that's to an come, important you know? insight right there because yeah. I think in the past you could sort of presume that's right. a certain level that's of right. formation or even yeah. familiarity with not just the church and the church's teachings, but. Um, deeper things, and that's that's gone. You're you're exactly right. I couldn't agree with you more yeah. that you can't presume. You have to start with the basics, yes. and, and yet challenge people for more. That God is God's infinite. Oh, I know. And we have to, you know. I mean, we always have to teach the truth with love. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, as, as as difficult as that is, right. sometimes you know, to to have an understanding and love for things that you think are crazy, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but to consistently do this and you know hopefully our sisters will do this and and we have so many requests to go all over Mm. so it's just it's wonderful it's a wonderful time it's a wonderful time to be a dominican too you know teach and (laughs) preach you know preach the truth right not to backtrack but i forgot to ask you because i'm just i'd like to know Kate O'Byrne, could you tell us oh, anything sure, sure. about that? Yeah, so Kate, Kate O'Byrne passed away a, a couple of years ago. Okay. She was a, an outstanding Catholic woman, um, a writer. She had a lot of influence on policy, was very okay. much engaged okay. in um, good things in, in the political world. Okay. Um, and then also she was uh, an editor at National Review and did okay. a lot of writing okay. there. But when she retired you saw another aspect of her really flourish, which was there all along. She was instrumental in the conversions of many significant people in Washington. And then after she retired from her active work with the National Review, she spent a lot of time trying to form the next generation, to mentor you know, young people, to bring them to Rome, to introduce them to the church with a bigger vision. And so she was, she was a tremendous Catholic, but very much grounded in recognizing the challenges that are in front of us and realizing that we need to just confront them and but strategically and with a smile she always That's had right. something funny to well, say how wonderful yeah. that you had the fellows well, that you you yeah, know have them you, honored. she passed the baton on <laughs> well, you, you get the baton now yeah. to go on so you know we cannot thank you enough for what you're doing for our thank culture you. what you're doing for uh, uh the catholics and not only that but uh people that are so hungry and suffering yeah. there is so much suffering like you say uh parents that come to you because mm-hmm. of, of of maybe their own children or right. ones that they know there's just so much suffering so how can we bring them healing how can we bring them help as mm-hmm. people like you that are going to do mm-hmm. that we do in the school you. but you need and to you. so <laughs> I, anyway we would just i want to thank you for coming and, well, you're and sharing your expertise with us and god thank bless you. you and i just hope go everywhere we want to <laughs> clone you. you to go thank you. i don't it's think we can do that though but let's clone you and just send you out all over the <laughs> world to you know preach the truth so thank you thank so you. much thank god you so bless much you. mother thank you. If you've enjoyed this particular show of The Culture Cast, please make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Twitter. But as always, all of this content can be found on goledigital.org.